Hymn 108, we'll sing this to begin our time of worship together. All glory, laud, and honor to thee, Redeemer King. All glory, laud, and honor to thee, Redeemer King, to whom the lips of children made sweet hosannas ring. Thou art the King of Israel, thou David's royal Son, who in the Lord's name comest, the King and Blessed One. The company of angels are praising thee on high, Mortal men and all things created make reply. The people of the Hebrews with palms before thee went. Our praise and prayer and anthems before thee we present. To thee before thy passion they sang their hymns of praise. To thee now high exalted our melody we raise. Thou didst accept their praises, accept the praise we bring. Who in all good delightest thou good and gracious King. Let's take our Bibles and look in Lamentations chapter 4 as we continue to read through and make some comments on this book that the Lord directed Jeremiah to write after the destruction of the city of Jerusalem and the temple. That's why the title Lamentations, time of weeping, and yet the Lord directing it all. And our text, I'll be reading from this uh, portion, is from verse 14 down to verse 22, Lamentations chapter 4. We looked at the first part last time, so we'll pick up with verse 14. We'll go back up to 13, which is really the beginning of the paragraph. For the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests that have shed the blood of the just in the midst of her. Here were these that the Lord had established to be the leaders of the people and yet they were the ones leading them astray. Same thing could be said today with preachers that people gather to hear. They serve their own interests and not that of Christ. And here, then in verse 14, we see just how grievous this was when the Lord brought judgment at the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians. It says in verses 14 to 17, they have wandered as blind men in the streets. That's what Christ called the leaders of in his day, the blind leaders of the blind. You say, why did these people follow these priests? And, well, they're blind. And so here they have wandered as blind men in the streets. They have polluted themselves with blood so that men could not touch their garments. Here it's speaking about them being so preoccupied of not defiling themselves because that's what the law said if you touch a dead body then you can't participate in any of the feasts feast days and here were these the lord had made it such there were so many dead bodies that even the self-righteous religious ones couldn't step anywhere without defiling themselves religiously and the lord purposed that they cried unto them verse 15 Depart ye, it is unclean, depart, depart, touch not. When they fled away and wandered, they said among the heathen, that would be among the nations, surrounding nations, 
they shall no more sojourn there. So here we find the Lord cutting off every escape for any that lived through this. Even to some that to escape the uncleanness, because now they saw the city defiled, they were going to try to go into some of these pagan nations and seek refuge. Particularly, as we saw already with Jeremiah, a bunch of them went down into Egypt, thinking that Egypt would be their savior, without realizing that God was going to send Nebuchadnezzar down into Egypt to destroy Egypt. So there was no safe haven, just like there is no safe haven for any upon whom God has brought judgment and condemnation. When it says they shall no more so sojourn there, this was the heathen saying, don't come here. Don't seek refuge here with us. And so they turned them back. And the anger of the Lord, it says in verse 16, hath divided them. He will no more regard them. They respected not the persons of the priests. They favored not the elders. So you have the priests and the leaders and the prophets prophesying falsely to the people and the people following them. But now that these were being scattered, now the people had no more confidence in them. Well, they shouldn't have had confidence in them in the first place. And verse 17 says, as for us, our eyes has yet failed for our vain help. And that's an important reminder that apart from Christ the refuge, everything else is vain. All other ground is sinking sand. In our watching, we have watched for a nation that could not save us. There it is again. They started looking around thinking there'd be some other nations to be able to save them. And uh, in vain, they sought help. Such is God's judgment. A lot of people take it for granted, but when God exercises that judgment, it is thorough. And so verses 18 to 20, we see how these would be pursued by the enemies of God's people. Notice how it's put in verse 18, very picturesque. They hunt our steps. These are like hunted animals that we cannot go in our streets our end is near. Our days are fulfilled. Our end is come. Well, that's what Jeremiah had told them even before it came. And yet there were false prophets running around saying, no, no, it's just temporary. Don't worry about it. Our persecutors are swifter than eagles of the heaven. They pursued us upon the mountains. They laid wait for us in the wilderness. The breath of our nostrils, the anointed of the Lord, was taken in their pits of whom we said under his shadow we shall live among the heathen so we see here that they had a profession when everything was calm thinking the Lord would be their protector but now that he was bringing his judgment upon them they acknowledge that all that they had said of him was vain when they said under his shadow we shall live among the heathen they're thinking in terms of, well, if God chases out from here, he'll protect us among the nations. But the Lord said, no, you're going to be pursued unto death. When it speaks of the pursuers, that's what persecutors is. It means to pursue. Being swifter than the eagles of heaven. At the time, and you remember we studied this in Jeremiah 52. Zedekiah the king, he was the last king standing and he tried to sneak out when the city was under siege and escape and they perceived it and went after him and took him and killed his sons right before his eyes and then put his eyes out and took him into captivity so this is what jeremiah is remembering here that these babylonians no matter where they turned and they regarded when it speaks there of the anointed in verse 20 the breath of our nostrils the anointed of the Lord that's really who they were talking about there they had considered that Zedekiah at least would be their last resort and they hoped that under his shadow they would be able to live among the nations but they were 
bitterly disappointed, as are any that ever put their confidence in men or in the flesh. In fact, Zedekiah was actually a very weak and a treacherous king. He condoned all kinds of religious corruption. You remember we saw that when we went through Jeremiah. And uh, therefore the Lord brought this condemnation. But now in verses 21 and 22, because up to this point, it's directed toward the people of Israel, but in verse 21 and 22 now, he addresses it to Edom. Remember, Edom was Esau's descendants, Jacob and Esau. And uh, Esau's descendants were the Edomites. And if you look on a map in the Bible, where Israel is on that map across the Jordan, the Edomites lived in the southwest part of Israel, what would be considered Jordan today. Southwest, southeast, right up in that area. And uh, so not even Edom would be spared. When Babylon came down, they took out Egypt. They took out everybody, Israel. And now the Lord directs it even toward Edom. He says, Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, that dwellest in the land of Uz. You remember another man that dwelt in the land of Uz? Ben Job. Read Job chapter 1. That's where he dwelt. He would have been down in this south, east, southwest part of that land that later was given to the Edomites. But when Jeremiah says here, Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, He's really speaking sarcastically because Edom had, when Israel was being brought out of Egypt, they refused to let the Israelites pass through their land or give them water. They were pursuing Israel even at that time and uh, laughing. So now the Lord says to them, all right, Now's your time to rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom. The cup also shall pass through unto thee, and thou shalt be drunken and shalt make thyself naked. The punishment of thine iniquity is accomplished, O daughter of Zion. He will no more carry thee away into captivity. He will visit thine iniquity. O daughter of Edom, he will discover thy sins. You see what Jeremiah is saying here is that the punishment that the Lord brought upon Israel was once and final. They were taken into captivity by the Babylonians and they would stay there for 70 years. But he's saying, Edom, and just remember what the Lord said, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Esau, these descendants of Esau, they weren't immediately brought to an end but over time they were to the point where today they no longer exist that land eventually when Israel came back it was merged into Israel but the thing that the Lord is saying about them was that there was to be mercy for the daughter of Zion Jacob have I loved but for Edom who mocked the Lord and mocked the people of Israel he said he will discover thy sins not cover them not put them away but discover them actually that word means to uncover them and that really is the way it is with regard to God's salvation or condemnation those that are saved they have in the Lord Jesus Christ that sin has been put away it's been finished when it says here, the punishment of thine iniquity in verse 22 is accomplished, O daughter of Zion. There was that chastising that took them away into Israel, but then the Lord brought them back and preserved them all the way until the time of Christ. But the contrast was with the daughter of Edom, or just like it says there of Esau, Esau have I hated. Ultimately, Edom was subdued and absorbed into Israel. 
And if you had the time, you could go over and read about this in Malachi chapter 1 for some extracurricular reading to see how the Lord, because Malachi was during this time as well, Jeremiah, Malachi, and uh, there he describes the judgment that he would bring upon Edom, Moab, where there was no covering for their sin, no pardon. And that's the truth. Without Christ, without God's mercies in Christ, there is no pardon. And it says there in verse 21, the cup also shall pass through unto thee. Thou shalt be drunken and shalt make thyself naked. Why is it that any of us are not condemned? It's because Christ drank that cup. And uh, he has given us his righteousness in the place of our nakedness. But all others will drink that cup of God's wrath themselves. And there is no hope. Gracious Father, I thank you for your word. Uh, we need to read it and understand it by your spirit. We know that all of this has taken place in history for our learning. How it is that you are God and just in all that you do. And that if you've been pleased to show us mercy, we know it's only for Christ's sake and not for anything in us. I pray as we continue our time of worship, you would make us mindful just how great a God you are. And how merciful and gracious for Christ's sake. And if you've been pleased to deliver us. We give you all the honor and praise and glory in his precious name. Amen. Let's take our hymn book one more time and sing hymn number 176. I love to sing this before we open the word. Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me. That's Christ, the bread of life. Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me. As thou didst break the loaves beside the sea, beyond the sacred page, I seek thee, Lord. My spirit pants for thee, O living word. Bless thou the truth, dear Lord, to me, to me. As thou didst bless the bread by Galilee, then shall all bondage cease, all fetters fall. And I shall find my peace, my all in all. Thou art the bread of life, O Lord, to me. Thy holy word, the truth that saveth me. Give me to eat and live with thee above. Teach me to love thy truth, for thou art love. Oh, send thy spirit, Lord, now unto me that he may touch my eyes and make me see. Show me the truth concealed within thy word, and in thy book revealed I see the I love those two words. Show me the truth concealed. Gold is never found on the surface, is it? As you dig, that's where you see the gold. But then it says, the second word I like is, in thy book revealed. Who do we see? The Lord. It's not just about times and seasons and 
and cultures and history. It's about the Lord. And I like that expression that in the old, the new is concealed in types and pictures and prophecy. And in the new, the old is revealed. So the old, the new is in the old concealed. The old is in the new revealed. But it's one subject. It has to do with Christ. And that's what we're finding out as we go through this study here in Esther. So let's turn to Esther chapter 6. And the Lord willing, I'll preach through this entire chapter here. Esther chapter 6. And it goes down to verse 14. Not too long. We're building toward a crescendo here in the book of Esther. Let's read this. And then I'll make some comments. I've entitled this message, Honor in the King's Gate. Now remember, that's where Mordecai sat, in the King's Gate. The gate was a place of judgment. And so as he sat there, he was in a position of authority, just like Christ. That's why I say Mordecai is a picture of Christ throughout the book of Esther. And particularly because he is the object of Haman's disdain. Yes, Esther was there as Ahasuerus' official queen. He had other women and whatnot, but she was there, and Mordecai is directing her to go into him to beseech him on behalf of her people. It had not even yet been revealed that she was actually a Jewess at that point. That was to be revealed, but we find Mordecai sitting at the gate directing those matters that pertain to the people. So he represents Christ as the representative head. And especially seeing the antagonism of Haman toward Mordecai, desiring to be rid of him. But while Haman's purpose out of hatred and disdain he was determined to have him killed. Yet what we're seeing here in Esther chapter 6, God's purpose was what? To honor Mordecai. Just like he purposed to honor his son. Peter said about Christ that he was delivered according to the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. And you have taken by wicked hands and have slain him. But they didn't do one thing more or less than what God purposed. When the scriptures speak about God's foreknowledge, it's not just him looking down through time and seeing what men will do and then reacting. When the scriptures speak about God's foreknowledge, it's his knowledge, prior knowledge to what he has already determined. That's why it's foreknowledge. He's already determined it. What will be the end? And he knows ahead of time. We don't. We discover what has been his determination all along. We can't know one nanosecond from now what he's purposed even for us here tonight. For all I know, we might not even finish this meeting and some meteor come and take this building out and that'd be it. We don't know. People say, oh, that'll never happen. Well, <laughs> that's what happened there when, in many a place where uh, in Pompeii, when all of a sudden that volcano, it, they've got people frozen in those positions they didn't know danger was coming, but God purposed it. And so that's why I say honor in the king's gate, because here was Mordecai sitting in that position where God had put him, Haman determined to undo him. And uh, we find him at the king's gate when this all begins. And guess what? We find him at the king's gate when it's all said and done. Nothing moved him. Nothing undid him. Just like with Christ. Nothing has moved Christ from that honor and glory that God the Father has purposed for him. But here again, we see how the Lord works because in chapter 6, it says, On that night, and you have to go back again to what night? Well, go back up to verse 14. When Zeresh, Haman's wife, and all his friends came to him and said, let a gallows be made of 50 cubits high 
And tomorrow speak thou unto the king that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. Then go thou in merrily with the king unto the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman, and he caused the gallows to be made. We saw that last time, that he was doing what he wanted to do, and yet all the while accomplishing God's will. So on that night, here were his plans. Man proposes, God disposes. Guess what? Could not the king sleep? This is a Hazarwaris. This is a man that rules over many different places and uh, parts of his kingdom. But he couldn't make himself sleep. And so he commanded to bring the book of records of the Chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Big Thana and Teresh, we saw that already in chapter 2, two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door, who sought to lay hand on the king Ahasuerus. In other words, they'd plotted to assassinate him. And all this was written in the Chronicles. And the king said, What honor and dignity hath been done to Mordecai for this? Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, There is nothing done for him. So already when you talk about Mordecai being honored in the gate, all of this is taking place behind the scenes. Already predetermined. His name already written in these chronicles. And what a beautiful picture of God's sovereignty. A sleepless night. King Ahasuerus did what many of us do, perhaps, when we can't sleep. What do we do? We get a book. Start reading until you fall asleep. That was his whole intention. Just go get me the Chronicles. Let's start reading here and maybe I'll get sleepy. Well, who's keeping him awake? See, I, that's where I thought reading this so much for so-called free will. If man had a supposed free will, he just determined I'm going to sleep and that'd be done with it. But he didn't. Because God's the one that gives sleep and he's the one that keeps us awake. Think about the next time you can't sleep. It's the Lord. For whatever reason, he's purposed that you be wakeful. And those are the times to cry unto him. But here's this mighty king, a master of over 127 provinces. That's how many he had. But not at all the master of sleep. Couldn't even sleep 10 minutes. That's an amazing thing when you consider it. And so it was found written. I love just how that's put. It's like when we go back and read the scriptures, it is found written, just like it was found written to Mordecai, that he was to be exalted and honored. So it's been found written of Christ that he is to be exalted and written. When you can't sleep, go back and start reading through the scriptures. Ask the Lord to open your eyes to Christ. So it was found written. Here again, I see something of the remarkableness of God's providence because you think about all the chronicles that were in the library I mean everything is being noted if you've seen some of these old movies they didn't have computers or you know dictation machines they had people that sat next to the king or were always transcribing everything had to be transcribed that's how it was done back then and you think about, number one, Ahasuerus can't sleep. So he sends word to go out. And he could have had 20 different diversions if he wanted to as far as what he was going to do. That's why they have what's called chamber music, classical. They bring in the, the music and try to play for the kings until he fell asleep. That's why it's called chamber music. I've noted that I get sleepy too when I ever go to those concerts and so like okay this will put you to sleep that was what it was designed to do but here again in God's sovereignty he commands what that a book be brought him to read now think about these servants running 
and all of these various scrolls and documents that there are, and of all of those particular ones of the records of the Chronicles, this one particular book is brought. The one that has Mordecai's name in it. You don't see how God's hand, even though his name's not mentioned here, is directing even in the choice of men. This is where we see he's sovereign over all. They were doing what they thought would best please the king. And I can imagine whatever servant was says, okay, here's one. Let's go take this to him to read. And yet the Lord was directing in it. But then again, think about that being open to that particular page because these were scrolls. Could have started over here and never got to it. Pretty soon Ahasuerus is asleep. But open to that particular page, to that exact place, telling the story of Mordecai and how he had saved the king from assassination. Don't you see how God was directing in everything that was taking place here? For what? To honor Mordecai, just like he directed all things to the honor and glory of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I couldn't help but think about the Ethiopian eunuch who traveled all the way to Jerusalem from Ethiopia. He was the minister of the treasury for the queen of Ethiopia at that time. Goes and procures a scroll. Could have had any number of scrolls possibly, but he procures a copy of the, the book of Isaiah. And on the way back, he's reading it. I say the Spirit of God was already at work in his heart. It wasn't when Philip showed up that suddenly now the Spirit was dealing in his heart. The fact that the Lord directed him all the way to Jerusalem. He went there for worship. And now on his way back, the Lord causes his path to cross with Philip. And when Philip asked him, do you understand what you're reading? He said, how can I unless a man guide me? And what was the portion he was reading? Isaiah 53 about the suffering lamb. He asked that question, is this about, who is this about? He asked the right question. And that's when Philip opened up the scriptures and preached Christ unto him, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I see taking place here in this particular situation, this book of the records. That word records is an interesting word. It actually means a book of remembrance. That's why they wrote it down, so that they could go back and remember. That's why we keep journals, to remember certain dates, certain events, certain things. And the Lord purposed that this be written in this book of remembrance. It caused me to think about Malachi chapter 3, if you look over in Malachi 3, where the Lord speaks here, it's the last book of the Old Testament. I usually go to Matthew and then go back one <laughs> to find it. But in Malachi chapter 3 in verse 16 it says, Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another and the Lord hearkened and heard it and a book of remembrance that's that same word, a record was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. You realize we're reading right now a book of remembrance in the Old Testament? It was written for who? Those that fear the Lord. That's why we can come back here and read these things and rejoice. Even as it says, they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. That's talking about their gathering and worship. We exhort one another as we meet together, point each other to Christ as we read this book of remembrance. Just like Christ spoke of that New Testament. This do in remembrance of me. So that's what this is here that we're reading about, how the Lord directed that this one particular book, this one particular page, this one particular person, Mordecai, should be the focus of the attention and he asked a good question coming back here to Esther 6 in verse 3 
What honor and dignity hath been done to Mordecai for this? I love that question even as it pertains to Christ. And we read through the scriptures in the Old Testament. What particular honor and dignity has been done to Christ for everything that is revealed of him here in the scriptures? People miss him. We'll go back and read and try to come up with some moral that they can learn from the Old Testament or some particular personal blessing. That's why most people read the Bible. They're looking for some personal blessing for themselves. That's not the purpose. What think ye of Christ? Just like here. What has been done for this Mordecai to honor and exalt him? And I would encourage you as you read through, if you've missed Christ at this point, start back at Genesis 1 again because he's right there. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Go back and compare that with what John said. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. It's all through. And I'll tell you, that's what grieved me the most after all my theological training I'd had that I'd missed Christ. And the Lord brought this particular question home to me. What particular honor has been done for this one here in the Old Testament throughout Scripture? Well, he's worthy of all honor, all glory. That's where the Lord directed Ahasuerus. Remember, this is a pagan king. And he's acting according to his thoughts and thinking, but the Lord directing him all the while to this one end, to honor and glorify Mordecai, even though Haman was opposed. So now we come to verses 4 and 5. Where Haman now is just happens to be coming through the court at that time. There's nothing that just happens. The king said, who's in the court? Now Haman was come into the outward court of the king's house. And what was his purpose in coming? To speak unto the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. It didn't take him long to build these gallows. We saw last time it was more like a pole with a stake lifted up about 75 feet. He was ready. He was in a hurry. And exactly at that time, with his intent to do nothing but destroy Mordecai, we read in verse 5, And the king's servant said unto him, Behold, Haman standeth in the court and the king said let him come in <laughs> Haman thought oh this is good I get an audience with the king immediately he wasn't aware of everything that was taking place behind the scenes here he was just thinking of himself like all do who are left to themselves that's all they think about themselves they're not thinking about God's glory but here again we see God and his sovereignty executing his judgments his will his way and that's true over all the affairs of men whether they know it or not there's a court of men on earth but there's the court of heaven which is over all and that's whose will will ultimately be done you can go all the way back some people say well Esther was lucky to be queen there's no such thing as luck or that Mordecai wasn't lucky to have heard of the assassination plot. Maybe he thought, this is not good. And he fell into it. But none of this was done by luck or by chance. Neither was it that Haman happened to come into the court at this particular time. All of these events were orchestrated by God and not by luck. When people say good luck, I don't know about you, but that's the worst thing you could ever tell somebody, good luck. Just It shouldn't even be part of our vocabulary. There's no luck to anything. May God direct would be a good thing to tell people. <laughs> you want to get their attention. It's not good luck. And so we see even here with regard to, see, most people like to think of God directing what involves good things. 
You ask people, and they say, oh, I'm blessed today. Well, what's going on? Oh, man, everything's just going the way I like it. But they don't see, nor do they give glory to God, even what they consider to be the bad things that take place. If you go over to Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, I love the word picture that's used here in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. When it says there, we know that all things work together for good, don't stop there. They're not all working together for good for everybody. It's not working together for good for those in hell. It's not working together for good for those that God has left to their own devices. Here it says, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Well, who loves God? We're talking about this God, not just a God, but this God, not the God of their imagination. Well, it tells us to them who are, notice the words, the called according to his purpose. The called, that means that's a specific people. But the word picture that's so beautiful here when it says in verse 28, we know that all things work together. That's where you get the word alchemist. And there's a few of them still around. I know we have one here in Shreveport. They still make their own compounds. And uh, they reach up on the shelf and they pull this particular product down and they pull that one down. Both of those separately and not mixed in the right dose would be poisonous. That's why they have dosages. But mixed together, that's what this word is. All things work together. It's presenting God as that great alchemist who takes all things separately, individually. These things would most certainly destroy us, but in God's purpose for the called, he works them together. He mixes it. <laughs> and gives it to his people for their good and his glory. That's a beautiful picture, I believe. And so that's what we see going on here, behind the scenes. So when, in verse 6, Haman comes in, it's interesting again how the Lord gave wisdom to Ahasuerus. He didn't just say to Haman, I want to honor Mordecai. The Lord directed even in how he posed the question so that Haman would actually fall into the snare and in thinking that he was the one that Ahasuerus was going to honor. That's what the Lord does. He catches people in their own devices. That is as much a judgment as anything. So Haman came in and the king said unto him, what shall be done? Notice, unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor. Haman's like, uh, I know the answer to this one here. That's, he's talking about me here. That's what it says. Now, Haman thought in his heart. That's where all corruption derives. It's from the heart. People seeking their own glory. And he says, to whom would the king delight to do honor more than to myself? See, everybody thinks that God's ready to honor them. But what they're doing and what they're thinking is the same delusion exists today. God does everything he does for his own honor and glory and that of his son. But here we see Haman thinking that somehow the king was about ready to honor him. Whom would the king delight to honor more than me? Remember what I said? You get in trouble if you think this Bible is about you. If I do this, this, and this, then this is what God's going to do in return. Oh, nope, you got it wrong. He's, got, he's purposed on her one person, just like here. Mordecai, representing Christ. And God often directs proud sinners to fall into their own trap. If you look over in Proverbs chapter 26. Proverbs 26 and verse 27. See what's written here. Proverbs 26 and verse 27 it says, Whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein. And he that rolleth a stone, it will return upon him. 
That's what they did with our Lord Jesus Christ. They thought by crucifying him, they'd be done with him. And they rolled the stone over that tomb, but Christ had already said, in three days I'll rise again. They dug the pit for our Lord Jesus Christ. And yet they themselves fell into that pit of destruction. When they cried, his blood be upon us and our children. That's how confident they were in what they were doing. And yet the Lord brought it all to bear against them. Here we see where God, and this is where we see God's sovereignty, taking the very pride of Haman and the deceitfulness of his sin and his arrogance and causing that to be his ultimate destruction. The very gallows that he built for Mordecai, he himself would hang on. Come back here now and Esther 6. Remember I said it's like building a crescendo here. Verses 7 through 9. Haman answered the king, For the man whom the king delighteth to honor. It's like that expression, it's best to keep your mouth shut and be thought a fool than open your mouth and leave no doubt. <laughs> He's opening his mouth and leaving no doubt here. Let the royal apparel. Now he's writing the script, but thinking it's about him. Let the royal apparel be brought which the king useth to wear. He's talking about even going and getting the king's apparel and clothing him in it. And the horse that the king rideth on. Everything that that's that king's, let it be to this one. And the crown royal which is set upon his head. See, this is a beautiful thing with regard to who we are in Christ because that's what God has done. He's literally taken the king's apparel and that crown and glorified his people in it. But this was a crown that only one was to wear and that was to be Mordecai, not Haman. Just like Christ, alone, crown him with many crowns. And let his apparel, this apparel and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes that they may array the man with all whom the king delighteth to honor and bring him on horseback through the street of the city and proclaim before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighteth to honor. You know, this is what honor the Lord God gave to our Lord Jesus as he entered into Jerusalem even to be crucified and slain. The crowds lined the streets and cried, Hosanna, blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And the Pharisees were upset about it. They wanted them to tell them that everybody be quiet. And he said, if I tell them to be quiet, the stones will cry out. Such was the purpose of God to honor his son, even in the midst of opposition. And so it is here with regard to Haman. Let the man whom the king delights to honor take that royal robe and be brought, which the king has worn. So in his childish desire to be praised and honored, he asked for what appeared to him to be the most important, and let it be done unto that man. Well, we know that's what God the Father has done with his son. That royal apparel is not for just anybody. It belonged unto Christ alone, even as here. And so the king gives a commandment, verse 10. You can imagine Haman, Haman at this point, the surprise factor. Then the king said to Haman, Make haste and take the apparel and the horse as thou hast said. And you can just almost feel him building up here. Here it is. I'm ready. And do even so to Mordecai the Jew that sitteth where? At the king's gate. That's why I entitled this Honor at the King's Gate. That's where he always had been. He didn't seek his own glory just like Christ didn't seek his own glory. And let nothing fail of all that thou hast spoken. Then took Haman the apparel and the horse and arrayed Mordecai and brought him on horseback through the street of the city and proclaimed before him, thus shall it be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor. 
this is God's sovereignty again where we see God causing Mordecai's arch enemy to actually execute this honor that was reserved for Mordecai alone. You talk about ultimate humiliation for Haman to honor Mordecai in such a public way. This was public. And so it wasn't just a private humiliation, but a, a complete humiliation. I think about our Lord Jesus Christ. When they crucified him, they thought that they were done with him, and yet that was how God had purposed that the seed of the serpent's head should be crushed. And over in Hebrews chapter 2, in verse 14, when you talk about an arch enemy of Christ, there's none greater than Satan himself. Haman represents all that opposes Christ. In Hebrews chapter 2, in verse 14, it says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood. See, this is why God was purposing Mordecai. It wasn't because Mordecai sought this, but he was elevating Mordecai for the deliverance of a people that Mordecai represented. It's like Christ. Then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Here Haman thought that he had the power of death and yet he himself would be destroyed. And what? Deliver them who through fear of death the Jews at this time, that commandment had already gone forth. There was a real fear of death who were all their lifetime subject to bondage for verily he took not on him that nature of angels. And I find this interesting back here. It was very specific when the king gave the command to exalt Mordecai. He called him Mordecai the Jew. <laughs> that was a representative head right there. Just like here, he did not give him a nature of angels, but took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. Everything that Mordecai was enduring by way of Haman's hatred now the Lord was exalting him on behalf of a people for the, his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. This is a very real trial for Mordecai, what he was facing, yet now God purposed to exalt him. So it just shows us, coming back here to wrap this up in Esther 6, in verses 12 through 14 that any that think to prevail against God and his son they cannot can't win it says Mordecai came again to the king's gate it doesn't tell us anywhere here that he even addressed Haman while this was all going on he came back to the king's gate but Haman hasted to his house mourning and having his head covered a picture of complete humiliation. And Haman told Jerish, his wife, and all his friends everything that had befallen him. And I love the way that's written. Befallen him. That's God's sovereignty and providence. He's not directing things. God is. Then said his wise men, <laughs> wise in men's eyes, and Jerish, Jerish, his wife, unto him, If Mordecai be of the seed of the Jews, before whom thou hast begun to fall, thou shalt not prevail against him, but shalt surely fall before him. Who's the one that put that thought into their minds? These are his counselors. Well, they, they're realizing the hand of God. You can't survive this. And while they were yet talking with him, came the king's chamberlains, and hasted to bring Haman unto the banquet that Esther had prepared. Here's where the Lord had given her wisdom to let this play out. Again, Esther representing the church as we pray for one another. To see how these things play out. Not 
think to have to resolve matters ourselves. And so comes this call now again for coming to this banquet. I'll conclude here by referring to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 8. This was a scripture that as I read this particular portion, the king honored in the gate. I truly believe had Haman known the end of what this would mean for Mordecai being exalted, he would have not done what he did. But he didn't know. He was thinking of himself. Just like those that crucified Christ over here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Again in verse 6, Paul says, We speak wisdom among them that are perfect. That means justified. He's talking about the Lord's people, justified by the death of Christ. But not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. Haman was a prince of this world that came to naught. But the wisdom we have to declare is none other than Christ, not knowing how he'll be pleased to use this for his glory. It says, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, verse 7, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. There's that predetermining by God himself, which none of the princes of this world knew. Ahasuerus didn't know ahead of time, and yet the Lord was directing him. Haman didn't know. In fact, it went exactly opposite. Esther didn't even know how this would turn out. For had they known it, it says, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto who? Unto us. By his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. What man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Well, that's how it's all turned out, to the glory and honor of God. And what a beautiful picture of how God has purposed to honor and glorify his Son. Hymn number 144. Think about the words in light of what we've just heard. Hark 10,000 harps and voices. Hark 10,000 harps and voices. Sound the note of praise above. Jesus reigns and heaven rejoices. Jesus reigns the God of love. See he sits on yonder throne. Jesus rules the world alone. Alleluia, 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 amen. Jesus, hail, whose glory brightens all above and gives it worth. Lord of life, thy smile enlightens, cheers and charms thy saints on earth. When we think of love like thine, Lord, we own it, love divine. Alleluia, 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 amen. King of glory, reign forever, thine an everlasting crown. Nothing from thy love shall sever, those whom thou hast made thine own, happy objects of thy grace, destined to behold thy face. Alleluia, 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 amen. Savior, hasten thine appearing, bring, oh, bring the glorious day. When the awful summons hearing, heaven and earth shall pass away. Then with golden hearts we'll sing, glory, glory to our King. 
Alleluia, 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 Amen. All right, well, have a good evening, and we'll look forward to it next time. Lord willing.